According to the World Health Organization, one in four people will suffer with a mental health problem at some point in their life. So to put that into some form of context, think of four people, friends, family members, or even colleagues, and the chances are that one of them may be suffering with a mental health problem. They may be doing exactly what I did, and that is suffer in silence. I'm here tonight to share with you my story, my story on mental health, in a way to break the silence on mental, um, mental health stigma and to get those people the help they need. So to begin with, I had a brilliant, brilliant upbringing. I had two loving parents and two brilliant brothers. But outside of that, it was completely different. In school, I was tormented, bullied, and quite often beaten up. I'd come home and I knew my brothers would always be there for me. There was one brother in particular who always had my back and he was always protective of me and the other brother. But he was that rock, that foundation, that support that I needed. I knew I could go home and he would be there, he'd always be on my side. And there's no better feeling knowing you have that in your life until so it's sadly taken away from you. Will died on the 25th of May, 2009, just 12 hours after walking down the aisle. So that was my crutch gone, my support, my foundation. I didn't know who I could turn to. I couldn't break down and cry again. History showed that if I broke down and cried, the bullies will attack me again. So I did what every man is told to do by today's society, and that's to man up, bottle up your emotions, get over it, and carry on. So that's what I did. I bottled up every single emotion I had, tossed it aside to serve another day. So let's fast forward five years. I met my partner, Amber. I got HND in mechanical engineering, and life felt really good. I had friends, family, and also health. But again, something was about to happen, something which I couldn't even predict was going to happen next. Little did I know I was about to encounter the first signs of PTSD or post-traumatic stress disorder. And that's where I started to hear voices. Now, these voices aren't of a cognitive thought like you're thinking to yourself. These are of, as if you're walking up the high street, everyone's decided to turn towards you and shout abuse at you. You're fat, you're ugly, she's better without you. So at first, I didn't know what was going on, so I couldn't tell anyone. I didn't have the support again, he was gone. So I did exactly what I did before and bottled everything up. Tossed it aside to deal with them the day. Unfortunately, things started getting worse and people around me, especially my partner, could see something that I couldn't. I was unwell. These voices got more intense. So much so, much so they actually took control. Punch that wall, kick that, break the door, smash the window. And I could do nothing but watch while this thing had control. Then it elevated even more. While this chaos was unfolding, my brother would be stood there in the corner of the room, judging me, just watching all this chaos unfold. My partner was there for everything, as well as my family, but Amber saw absolutely everything and she did her absolute best to get me out of this state. But unfortunately she couldn't. I was in denial, I thought this was just me. There's nothing wrong with me, man up, carry on as, as you do. But unfortunately, that's when I decided to speak to some friends. Um, now that has made it sound like a bad thing, but I decided that I'd see some friends and tell them about my problems. That kind of came about when Amber, unfortunately, was at her wit's end and she couldn't take anymore. I put her through a lot and she said, I'm going. Her bags were packed. Again, that was another crutch or foundation that was going. So I got onto both my knees and begged, please stay. She said, I will, I'll stay. You need to see a doctor. Next day, I saw a doctor. Within minutes, I was signed off as unfit for work. Now, going back to my friends, I opened up to them because I spoke to the GP and that opened up so many avenues. I saw psychiatrists, I saw therapists, I got medication and things started to get a bit better. Got a bit of self-respect again, opened up to their said friends. And on face value, they seemed really happy that I opened up. They could also see I wasn't well. I told them about the scars I've got on my hands from punching things and smashing things. And I felt good. 
This unfortunately came to the end when I had a psychotic episode at who I thought was my best friend's birthday party. Again, within days, social media accounts were made in my name. I had a bombardment of cyberbullying and people were pretending to be me and saying vile things to other people. That made my fingertip grip on my own reality and my own safety go to its very, very end. Even when you think it can't get worse, it does. I received a text. Don't come back. We know you're faking it. With that, I stood up calmly. Amber sat beside me. Walked out to the garage. And went to hang myself. Now, thankfully, what I haven't mentioned yet is that my self-coping mechanism was to comfort eat. So I put on a lot of weight. I was at 23 and a half stone and the, the, simply the roof joist broke. I fell to the floor. Pure luck. I was given an extra life. Amber walked in and found me, checked me for injury, took the ligature off my neck, went to hospital. Checked by therapists up there, given medication and then sent home. Unfortunately, I was still in psychosis. And that night I took an overdose. That's two trips to A&E in one night. Not only did I feel the lowest of the low and I didn't have any hope, I finally felt like I'd lost the war and the fight against the war against myself. Now there's a statistic by Rethink, the mental health charity, that in 2017, 6,000 suicides happened, occurred. That's roughly one person every two hours. And that's a statistic I never thought I'd ever at any point nearly be a part of. <coughs> now from this, the turning point as it were, Amber went to carer sessions with the same charity, Rethink, where, ch where people could meet up, discuss their problems and basically have a respite. And they've organised a night where they could get the people they're caring for together. Now again, I thought I was a danger, not only to myself, but to others. I didn't want to go because what if it made me feel worse? What if it reaffirmed to myself that I had no hope? So I decided to go, not for me, but again, for my, for my relationship and for my partner. And I left the session feeling massively empowered. I met people who are CEOs of their own company with the same diagnosis that I have, which is PTSD, borderline personality disorder and social anxiety disorder. These people own their own companies, massively successful, went up the managerial chain. And this gave me hope. This set fire going. I am a normal human being who's encountering normal human emotions. So again, with Amber, my support, I got in touch with an old school friend and his cousin. And then we decided to start a podcast. This was just three guys sitting in a, a dingy room <laughs> talking about video games, news, films, anything. It was just three guys talking and it got that successful. We actually made the iTunes top 100 for about 10 minutes. <laughs> but people started to give us messages and people loved what we were doing. And for me, it felt incredible because I was just being me. This is my soul being poured out online. People could see me for who I was. And then I wanted a new challenge. I decided to take up running. Now at my heaviest weight, I thought, right, I'm going to lose weight, get better, lace up my trainers, headphones in and go for a run. That run nearly killed me, <laughs> but in a good way. This ignited a fire and I wanted a challenge. I'm going to go for this. So in eight months, I'd lost seven and a half stone, all the way through running. And because of this image alone, and the way I see myself now, is I can not only see that I've lost the weight and I look better in general, I, my personal opinion, um, <laughs> <laughs> but the fact that, going back to an image previously, I don't look unwell, I look happy. I don't even recognize that guy previous, I don't even believe that was me. <laughs> but it gives me a simple mantra through life. If you survive one day, just one day, with a mental health problem, you're no longer a sufferer, but you're a survivor. And that's where I need your help. See, that figure I told you at the start, one in four people, we all know that, it's said quite regularly. 
For every one in four people suffering with a mental health problem, there's always three more who can help save a life. So if I can get you tonight to leave this room or go wherever you, where you go, and you speak to a friend who doesn't seem quite right or on edge or not seeming themselves, if I can get you to ask them, are you okay? Then at least my work here is done. When you walk out this room, I just want you to remember, every one in four people, three others can save a life. My name's Tom, and I just want to know, are you okay?